Joining me is Dr Chris Kiefer, a medical doctor and president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy. Thanks for joining us, Chris. I uh, really appreciate the chance to talk to you. First, tell us about Canada. Canada is not as blessed uh, with the coal reserves that Australia has, but you have an enormous amount of gas and also an enormous amount of hydroelectricity power. Why has uh, there been a push back away from coal to nuclear power, especially in a big uh, province like Ontario? Well, most of the nuclear is concentrated in the province of Ontario, and that's precisely because we weren't blessed with the kind of coal reserves that Australia has. And so we were importing coal over from the United States. And, you know, when the 1973 energy crisis hit, we had a doubling in that price of coal, and we'd been developing this nuclear reactor technology. We ended up commissioning 22 reactors in just 22 years and accidentally decarbonized our electricity grid. Um, so it's, it's interesting that a power source can help grow an economy and accidentally decarbonize. I think that shows you something about how cost effective it can be. And now with the continuing, continuing push for net zero, some of that's been expanded because around the world after Fukushima, there was a lot of push to get out of uh, nuclear. But now we're seeing uh, in, uh, in South Korea, in uh, Finland, in France, uh, in, in the UK, going back to nuclear. What's your assessment of Australia's options when it comes to reliable, affordable, emissions-free electricity? Well, listen, the grid is a civilizational life support structure, and I think there's symptoms that it's not doing well right now. You know, I pick up a newspaper here in Australia, and I see story after story, rolling blackouts anticipated this summer because of low wind and, and high temperatures from the end of the La Nina effects. Um, I see coal stations that are being life extended because the reliability of the system is in such peril. You see the blowouts at Snowy 2.0. Um, the situation is not looking great. I think it's always important to have a plan B. Um, and, you know, what we're seeing here, I think, indicates that it's better to have more tools in the toolbox than to cut something out that actually has a proven record of de decarbonization. There's no jurisdiction in the world that has achieved what we have in Ontario, which is a deeply, again, decarbonized grid with, with wind and solar. That just hasn't happened to this date. Let me show you what our current uh, federal uh, Labor climate and energy minister tends to say about the nuclear option. The most expensive form of energy and the slowest to roll out, uh, nuclear. You know, the only thing small about a small modular reactor is the output. Nothing small about the cost. What do you, how do you fact check a statement like that, Chris? Well, I hate to rub it in, but our emissions are one-tenth those of Australia and Ontario, and our electricity is one-half the cost. Again, we, we commissioned 22 large nuclear stations in 22 years. You know, when there's a sense of urgency in Australia, I can see that there's a bipartisan moves that can happen, such as with the AUKUS situation. And I think as the grid in Australia continues to become more unreliable and more expensive, eventually that will lead to a search for other options. And I think if you want those to be low carbon ones, that's going to have to be nuclear. Yeah, I think it's inevitable too for those reasons. And we're seeing enormous backlash around the country as we look to put in wind turbine farms, offshore wind projects, solar farms, massive transmission projects to connect all of this. So you're creating a lot of other environmental problems and using up a lot more land. Uh, one of the advantages of nuclear is it's concentrated in the land it requires and plugs into largely the existing transmission network. That's absolutely true. The entire nuclear sector, including the uranium mines, the factories, the fabrication of fuel and the power stations, even the waste storage, fits on 20 square kilometers of land uh, in Ontario. That's the size of our Pearson International Airport in Toronto. So this is an incredibly dense form of energy, which means that it has the lowest environmental impacts. It requires the least mining and the least land footprint. And so really, nuclear is the most environmentally friendly form of energy. Um, but it's been misrepresented so much over the years. It sure has. And one of those relates to people's health and safety. Just very quickly, as a medical doctor, your assessment there? You're right. I'm a medical doctor. I am the source of the largest amount of radiation, artificial radiation that people get every year. We all get a natural background dose. Uh, medical doc doctors deliver the, the majority of that. But it makes me literate in, in again, that dose of radiation. Um, and the nuclear industry has done an extraordinarily good job um, at limiting, limiting any emissions from the plants. I mean, our, we have a perfect track record in terms of nuclear waste storage. Just the fact that we can contain 
all of the waste that's produced is remarkable and again speaks to that incredible energy density. So you know I live with my family about 20 kilometers from one of uh, Ontario's large nuclear stations. I feel very safe living there and so does the community around the plant. Thanks so much for talking to us Chris I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Chris Kiefer there sharing with us some of the insights from Ontario in Canada. We need to learn and follow this. I think, like Chris said there, I think it's inevitable Australia will go down this path, especially given we have such great uranium reserves that we're exporting to much of the world. We'll go to this form of energy eventually. So every year we dawdle, we just add to our own burden.